with the leaky gut because I want to make sure I've got a lot of people wanting to know, okay, you're, this is all great information, but what do I do about it and what supplements? So with the leaky gut um, bundle supplements, that you can all find it um, on sarabantahealth.com. There's the Mega Pre, Mega Mucosa, and the Mega Spore. How do these three supplements help guard your your gut and heal that leaky gut? Yeah, um, and this is what we we worked on this for ten years to really figure out what is the steps that occur that lead to a leaky gut, and then how do we reverse those steps? Right. So it's that's just that plain and simple. Um, the first thing that occurs anytime your gut becomes leaky is dysbiosis. That is the shifting of organisms where you're going away from all these important keystone species that protect the structures, that protect the tight junctions, that protect the mucosa to a predominance of organisms that don't, that eat away at the mucosa, that produce toxins, right? So the first thing that you have to do is shift the microbiome. So then the question is, how do you shift the microbiome back towards these important keystone species, that's where the spores come in. One of the, one of the discoveries that we made was not only that spores um, can compete against dysfunctional bacteria. They've been known for that since 1950s because there's a drug in the market that was launched in 1952 call, uh, from Sanofi Aventis uh, called Entrogermina. It's a bacillus endospore probiotic that's used to treat dysentery and gut infections. Right, that drug, it's a probiotic drug that's been on the market since 1952. And they still use it today for traveler's diarrhea and other infections of the gut because it's known that Bacillus does a great job of seeking out, identifying, and bringing down the growth of dysfunctional bacteria. But what we hypothesize is not only does it do that, it probably increases the growth of the beneficial bacteria. And so we published at least two papers showing that is that when you add the bacillus, not only does it bring down those dysfunctional pathogens, but it dramatically increases the growth of the beneficial bacteria, what we call keystone species that go to work rebuilding all of those structures, right? They rebuild the mucosa by producing things like short chain fatty acids, uh, by eliciting uh, gene expression of things like the muc T gene that causes your goblet cells to produce more mucus. They increase the expression of the tight junction proteins so you can rewire these cells to pull them back together. They increase the expression of an interleukin that when there's a gap from a damaged uh, intestinal epithelial cell that's been kicked out, it replaces that with a new healthy cell, right? So it so these microbes reform the structures. So the first step in fixing leaky gut is fixing the dysbiosis. That's the megaspore. The second step is- Real, real quick, Karan, can you um, just specify spore versus probiotic? Because I don't think a lot of people understand that you, what you're talking about is not just the typical probiotic you go to the market for. Yeah. And, and the thing is, the vast majority of probiotics on the market don't qualify as probiotics per the supplement definition, right? So, or per the scientific definition. So the, the accepted World Health Organization definition of a probiotic is a live microorganism when administered in adequate amounts confers a health benefit to the host. So the very important part of that first part of the definition is that it has to be live. It has to function alive in the GI tract, right? So which means it has to survive through the gastric system and make it to the intestinal tract alive. And it has to have a metabolic function in the gut to improve the health of the host. And that has to be measured. The vast majority of probiotics on the shelf in the market at the stores are going to die in the gastric system, right? They're not even designed to be, by nature, designed to be alive in the gut. And so they don't actually fit the definition of a probiotic. Now you go to the spore, the spore is even more different because not only does the spore survive, but it does so because it has this capability of wrapping itself in a armored like uh, calcified armored like protein coating. And it does that anytime it's outside of the body. So if it leaves the body through defecation, it's no longer in its natural habitat, which is the gut. So it covers itself in this, in this armor like coating. So it can exist in the outside environment indefinitely until swallowed again. And that armor-like coating allows it to uh, survive through the harsh gastric system. And the moment it hits the small intestine, it comes out of this armor-like coating and goes to work for you as a probiotic. 
right? So this is a really important component of the spore. Now, that doesn't mean all spores act as probiotics either, because there's lots of spores that are, you know, adapted to living in this creature or that creature or this environment or that environment. What you really need is a spore that's been designed by nature to live in the human gut and understand the human microbiome, because it has to, when it gets in there, identify the, the dysfunctional bacteria, sit next to them, have the tools to reduce the growth of those microbes, and then have the same to uh, have different tools to increase the growth of the beneficial bacteria. So we were very, very careful in selecting the right spores and megaspore. And it took decades of work with uh, Simon Cutting and the folks, the researchers at University of London, uh, Royal Holloway, to identify the right spores that had these capabilities, right? So the, just keep in mind that the vast majority of probiotic products and, and strains out in the shelf that you can get just walking into the health food store have never been tested in the human system right? Certainly not the finished formula that they're putting out there. And we know that many of those formulas will contain microbes that either A, are not properly characterized, meaning it's a different microbe in the product than the, what they're claiming on the label. And B, they have no idea what happens when you combine all these microbes together, right? Because companies just go, more is better. So we're going to put 15 strains at 100 billion CFUs as if just throwing a bunch of stuff together is the best approach. We know now from a couple of studies from the uh, from Israeli Institute and so on that some of these what I call kitchen sink formulas actually do more harm than good. We've actually done a bunch of studies where we see that the majority of probiotic strains that we test are actually very inflammatory. Mm -hmm. They turn on inflammation in the body more than anything else, right? So we have to be careful with probiotics. We want to make sure it's strains that have been studied in humans to know what happens clinically to know what happens to the microbiome. And if it's a formula of more than one strain, that the combination has been studied, right? So hopefully that 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 helps and makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the spores start to fix the dysbiosis. They bring down the dysfunctional bacteria and they dramatically increase the beneficial bacteria. Then the next step is to feed the right prebiotics. So this new microbiome that you're developing, which has this really high levels of keystone species that are beneficial, those microbes get fed adequately so that they can start to establish themselves. And this becomes more of your dominant microbiome, right? And it doesn't keep fluctuating between the pathogens winning out sometimes, and then the beneficial bacteria fight back and they go back and forth, right? This is what happens when you take, for example, loads of antimicrobials or an antibiotic to try to fix your gut, right? What, what is happening is you may knock down the, the pathogens for a short period of time, but then they just come rearing back up, right? So just look at the number of SIBO patients that have gone through two, three, four rounds of rifaximin with no, with no good results to show for it, right? Because you can't fix the microbiome like that. You can't take all these microbes, knock everything down and hope that what comes back is good, right? More than likely what comes back is going to look similar to what was there before. And so, so what we want is a true ecological change to the microbiome where the good functional bacteria win out over time and take over the real estate, right? And that's what the combination of the probiotic and the prebiotic does. Now, the last step in this is called mega mucosa. The reason it's called that is because there's some critical components that are designed to rebuild that mucosa lining. Mm -hmm. Remember that mucosa lining in the small intestine is thin, uh, because it makes it easier to absorb things. But in the large intestine, where the, ver where the largest variation of microbes exist, the mucosal layer is very thick and there's two distinct structures to it. And if you do, don't have a thick mucosal layer, you have a significant risk of chronic disease, right? This is called mucosal dysfunction. If you look up mucosal dysfunction, you see that virtually every chronic disease is tied to that, including very scary things like Crohn's, colitis, microcolitis, colorectal cancer, and so on. Those are all associated with a diminished mucosal layer, right? So rebuilding the mucosal layer becomes really important. So what's in there to in order to rebuild the mucosal layer? Well, the mucosal layer is made up of four amino acids that are bound to sugars that becomes the structure of the mucosa. If you don't have adequate intake of those four amino acids in your diet, you can't rebuild the mucosa. 
-hmm. even if you have beneficial bacteria to do it. So we wanted to make sure that we put those four key amino acids in the product. And then we added polyphenols. Now, the reason we added polyphenols is number one, polyphenols reduce inflammation in the mucosa, which in order to repair anything on your body, you have to reduce the inflammation, right? If the, if the system is inflamed, it cannot repair, right? The analogy I give is like, if you give, get a cut on your hand, if you just leave it, it's going to heal itself, right? But imagine every morning you woke up and twice a day, you rubbed it really hard, you scratched at it, right? Adding <clears throat> irritation and inflammation to it, that'll negate the repair. The same thing happens in your gut, right? If your gut is continuously inflamed and irritated, it will negate the repair. So you want to get some polyphenols and antioxidants in there to reduce some of that inflammation. And then the polyphenols also feed a very important bacteria called acromantia. And acromantia plays an important role of rebuilding that mucosal structure by inducing the gene expression that's needed for that. On top of that, we also have immunoglobulins. Immunoglobulins bind up all these toxins that are in your system, your LPS and mold toxins and all that, reducing the toxigenic load in that mucosal structure so that it can rebuild itself, right? So we've gone through painstaking detail looking at that pathology of how leaky gut starts and what happens in sequence. And then this system is designed to reverse that sequence, right? So the immunoglobulins, I hope I'm saying that right, that's the mega IgG 2000, mm -hmm. correct? And that is something that I take daily. I kind of think about it as the little Pac-Man that kind of cleans up the stuff mm -hmm. that's not supposed to be there. Um,